It's one o'clock on Tuesday, April the 19th, so you must be watching Science at Soast. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every week we bring in an exciting new student to tell us about their research. Soast stands for the School of Ocean, Earth Science and Technology at UH Manoa campus. And today I'm really excited to have Nafia Gower Pasquelon, who is a graduate student in Earth Science, and we're going to be talking about ocean research cruises. So, Natalia, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. I'm really excited to hear about the, the kind of work which you do. But maybe for the viewers, you can just say a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Pete, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here sharing about my research today. And so I, I am from Brazil. I am currently in my second year of PhD at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And I took my undergrad and my master's in Brazil. And all of my research has been so far related to volcanic rocks uh, and volcanoes. So now I'm starting to study a little bit of seamounts and underwater volcanoes too. So that's okay. what I'm going to so, do. So that might explain if you're interested in volcanic rocks, why you've come to Hawaii, because it's <laughs> volcanic islands. <laughs> yes, because uh, when I was working in Brazil, uh, I was working with the last Brazilian volcano, which is in Trindade Island. And after that, for my PhD, I decided that I wanted to go somewhere where I could be pretty close to an active volcano. <laughs> <laughs> so in Hawaii, I have this opportunity. Excellent. Good. Well, you mentioned seamounts, uh, and I think the viewers may not be that familiar with seamounts being old volcanoes. Um, maybe we can go to the first slide and you can just talk us through, if you're interested in studying volcanoes, why study seamounts? And here's a cartoon. What is it we're looking at, Natalia? Okay, so seamounts, uh, they are um, volcanoes that don't get uh, to, they, they don't get out of the sea level or they can become seamounts after being volcanic islands and submerging. Um, so in this chart here, uh, I'm presenting a, a little bit of how the seamounts form. And there are some different ways that a seamount can be formed, but the most uh, famous, we can say, one is through a hotspot. Uh, hotspots are columns of very hot, buoyant material that rises from the core mantle boundary or from the low, lower mantle and upper main, mantle boundary. And once it reaches the oceanic crust, it starts to generate volcanism and to create these small volcanoes uh, that if there's a continuous magma supply, then these seamounts, they start getting bigger and bigger and bigger, reach the sea, fall, the, the sea level, become volcanic islands. So if we consider that this source of uh, volcanism is quite fixed or it doesn't really move that much in relation to the plate. Uh, we can think that if the plate is moving to the left, as we can see in the cartoon, then this source is going to be imprinting volcanoes. And uh, once the volcano moves far from the source, from the heat source, because of the plate movement, then uh, these volcanoes are going to start submerging. And this is what happened to the Hawaiian islands. It's happening right now. <laughs> so. yeah. And you know, the viewers may not realize, but Hawaii is the classic place on this planet where you have this kind of hotspot volcanism. And they might be familiar with the activity, say, of Kilauea or Mauna Loa on the big island. But where we live, Oahu, of course, was formed the same way. And in your diagram, you had um, other examples like Midway Island to our northwest. That's a, a Hawaiian volcanic island, correct? 
and then so, at the midway is a, a volcanic island that millions of years ago was like Kauai, or if we go further uh, to the north and west, that is where we have other uh, volcanic islands which have sunk below the ocean. Uh, and uh, I would guess that the other thing which we need to point out for the viewers is, of course, that these uh, volcanic islands move or are moved because the ocean plate is moving uh, a process related to plate tectonics. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we see the arrow pointing uh, to the left of the slide, Pacific plate motion. It's moving at about the rate your fingernails grow is what I'm told, you know, a few centimeters a year or a couple of inches. So um, is Hawaii the, the only um, volcanic chain like this? Uh, no, actually, if you can put the next slide on. <laughs> okay. There are several hot, some different hotspot chains in the Pacific uh, Ocean. And uh, we rely, uh, now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about my research, the focus of my research. Um, so if we can try to track the plate movement from zero to 70 million years old, uh, we can really rely the model in two hotspots. One of them is Hawaii, and the other one is Louisville, which is in the extreme south. Um, these two, they are long-lived progressive chains of volcanoes, and we can uh, have a very good uh, idea on how the plate, the Pacific plate, moved for that period. Right. However, wow. um, if we go uh, more than 70 million years, if we go older than that, at up to up to 120, there, the current model relies on structures that are not very good for, for that, because some of them, they are not these long-lived chains of hotspots. So we went on a cruise to try to find the oldest portions of what we think can be um the oldest portions of the two hotspot chains let's just backtrack uh, and take a, another look at that second slide um to help the viewers understand what it is they're looking yes. at the, the, it, this looks as if it's uh, um a map of the ocean floor topography you've got north america to the top right australia to the bottom left asia the top left and the colors just refer to the depth of the water, would be my guess. Yes. So the and island chains are the light blue. Um, the white lines just show the trace of where the uh, um, the seamount chain is. Yes, thanks for pointing this out. <laughs> I went straight to the explanation of the, <laughs> the figure. <laughs> but for the ones who are not familiar with what I'm talking about, um, this age progression, these straight white lines, they're highlighting the tracks. Yeah. So if we, can if we can find two very good other long-lived hotspot tracks for the oldest ages, this would be perfect because then the model is going to be much better. So we're trying to find the oldest portions of the Rurutu and Samoa hotspots, which are in the middle of the, the Pacific here. And these oldest portions, they are assumed to be in the West Pacific Simon province. So that's where our cruise went. Uh, we okay. went all the way to the West Pacific uh, pretty close to the Mariano Strange. We actually went over the Mariano Strange. Which and... is the deepest part of the, the ocean floor. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, and I think that in the next slide, we we have a picture of the depth that we were like, oh no, this is yeah. just... <laughs> so this is the research vessel that we, mm -hmm. we were on board. And our research on board consisted mainly first in mapping the seafloor so that we can find the best dredging sites and finally uh, pick up the, the rocks from the seamounts that we think can be these older, 
oldest portions of these two hotspot tracks. Now, so, tell, tell us about the, the Kilo Moana. I understand that's operated by the University of Hawaii. Yes. How, how, do you know how big it is or how many people uh, would work yes. on that? That's um, the one that we see uh, down at whatever it is, Pier 35, something like that on a regular <laughs> basis, yeah? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm not sure about the size, the exact size, but I know that in terms of people, we had around 12 scientists on board and around 25 people from the crew. So, so yeah, less than people. 40, yeah. And how long does it go out to sea? Is it like a couple of days or a month or mm -hmm. how long can it stay out on the ocean? Um, so we stayed for 40 days 40 on the days. ocean. Yes, 40 days. And uh -huh. but I'm pretty sure it can go a little bit longer <laughs> without <laughs> needing more supplies. But but that that is an impressive ocean going vessel that the university operates. Yes. Yeah, that's good. It's so, very good. Yeah. It has uh, some good installations for lab work uh -huh. we needed. So this was essential for us. Right. And I think we'll see some of the lab work later in today's <laughs> talk. But you're trying to find the oldest part of um, the seamount chain that runs through uh, Samoa. So how do you map, say, the ocean floor? Mm -hmm. How do you get, where do you know where to go? Yes. So the research vessel is equip equipped with uh, multi-beam bathymetry. And I think now we, we got a, a slide. Yes. There we go. Okay. Yes. Uh, so if you take a look at the middle of the image that is in the center of the screen, uh, there's a, a blue small triangle, a very, very small point that is following a yellow line. Uh -huh. So this is our research vessel. And this is um, a view from above, let's say. And so towards to the both sides of the cruise here this all this blue thing in the in the screen is the mapping of the seafloor and if we take a look at the bottom image which is more colorful we're starting to see some topography um so we use the multi-beam bathymetry which consists in sound waves that are emitted from the research vessel and then reflected back when they hit the seafloor so we can calculate, uh, we have the velocity and the time that the sound waves take to go and come back. So we can calculate the depth of the water column and then uh, the depth of the seafloor. So the, the multi-beam, people may have heard of sonar, sound waves passing yes. through the water, right? And the bathymetry, think of that as the height of the ocean floor or at least the, the depth beneath the, the sea level right yes exactly okay. Okay. so once we map the seafloor we can have a clue of uh, which would be the best structure for dredging so uh -huh. we can go to the next slide please so here we can see we were going around a, a crater a submarine crater uh, which was awesome. So this site we dredged uh, from the inside of the crater and a little bit from the outside, if I'm not mistaken. But to find, to, to say, hey, this is the point, this is the track that I want the crews to go and dredge. You can go to the next slide. <laughs> uh, just before we do that, um, in the previous slide, the colors that we are seeing um on the computer screen presumably at, at different depths right so yes um the, the the brown might be um the summit crater of the sea mount exactly then, yeah, if okay, you take a okay. look on the left there's a number 2781 this is yep. meters meters depth uh -huh. so that's uh, the top of the crater was in this depth okay and um, what's what's the goal do you go for the 
the summit crater, which might be the youngest, or do you go to the flanks to um, find the old stuff? Usually we try to go to the deepest part that we can, because uh -huh. the cruise, uh, there's a track, it goes through a track. So it goes from the deepest to the shallowest so that you can like dredge uh, through okay. an upper slope. Yeah. Okay. So okay. yeah, the next slide can show a little bit more. Uh, so, oh, I see. Yeah, finding the best the best dredging sites. These maps they are generated by a combination of the slope and the reflectivity. These ones are yeah, it's a combination of the slope and the reflectivity. And when is very very red, it's the best. It uh, suggests that this would be a good place for dredging. So. Uh, that's how we decide oh the cruise is gonna be dredging around here yeah. or not <laughs> presumably you don't want to dredge where there's thick sediment would be a, a guess exactly you know, and that's why um the reflective the ability of the spotum to reflect sound waves strongly might suggest that there are bare rocks there yes okay exactly okay. good <laughs> All right. So, how quickly can you find a good place to go dredging? On do you dredge <laughs> just once, or you know, how long does it take to pull a basket? Three yeah. So down? it depends because, like, sometimes depending on the conditions of the wind and the waves, we really have we struggle to find a good dredging spot. So it can take some time, and then once we really find a good spot. It takes a couple of hours to put the dredge down. I think like one or two hours. Yes. And then it goes like for uh, a couple of other hours until the, the cruise is done with the track. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. We were so dredging the, the, next, one... the next slide shows people um, uh, on deck, right? Do, yes. do you li literally just throw the, the sample <laughs> bag? Oh, yeah. How does it work? Yeah, so uh, it's not that simple, just throwing the dredge basket into the water, huh. right? Uh, first of all, you have to be wearing protective uh, equipment. And yeah. this is just like a picture of all this, the women scientists that were on board. And we were, uh, so there, there are four people at least have to be on deck to put the dredge in the water. Uh -huh. And there are some engineers that stay around to help us. And yeah, so we putting the dredge is not so hard, but taking it back when it's full of rocks. Uh, I think the next slide That's is about, uh, yes. So when we're, we have to literally fish the dredge basket, <laughs> uh, which uh -huh. is shown in this figure on the left. And then hopefully, we have a bucket full of pillow lavas, which are ideally the best ones for being analyzed because they represent uh, submarine lavas and they're not like sediment or they don't have uh, fragments of sediment within them. So massive pillow lavas would be the best ones. And we call them pillow because of their rounded shapes. They really uh -huh. resemble pillows. And these are exclusively formed underwater. So they're pretty cool. You can take a look in the right picture here. Okay, but if you were trying to find the oldest rocks on any seamount, um, perhaps those lavas would have been erupted above sea level. Um, here you're seeing pillow lavas, which were obviously erupted underwater. Yeah. So, um, uh, would you necessarily think they are the oldest rocks from this seamount? Um, well, not necessarily the oldest because, I mean, these ones could have been formed um, a couple of years younger than the oldest one. Uh -huh. <laughs> but for yeah. sure, they were not subaerial. They were not for, from the stage when the volcano was uh, above, above the sea level okay. yes so we can be happy about those they're at least uh, <laughs> from the underwater stage and, and is that a typical number of rocks that a, a dredge 
might actually pull up. It looks like a dozen rocks or something like that. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, no. do you bring up fish or do you bring up uh, a whole range of other things? Uh, we had uh, some different stuff coming up, such as uh, shark teeth. Uh -huh. I we think it's a megalodon, like pre prehistoric shark teeth coming oh, up. Really? But, yeah, but usually um, it varies a lot. Some dredges were full of massive rocks. Some dredges were almost empty, like with very few pebbles, which were pretty hard to like accept. <laughs> because it takes so much work to to find a good spot put the dredge in the water and then take the rocks back so sometimes uh, it can and, be very frustrating and, and uh do you get any hint we saw uh trying to find the best place to dredge is there a correlation did you learn on your cruise which places are most likely to produce good samples in the, the dredge bag or not uh yes uh actually uh we have to avoid the flat tops the flat surfaces mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. all the ridges of the volcanoes that are kind of connected to the flat surfaces so it's better if you go a little bit further side. off yeah to the side because mm -hmm. the chance of getting corals and rocks that we really don't want <laughs> uh, <laughs> gets yeah and I think slide nine, the next one, will show in more detail some some of the rocks. So, would this be a typical haul that the kinds of rocks you bring out? Uh, first of all, what what is a hyaloclastite? Okay, so hyaloclastites are uh, types of fragmented rocks. How you can see in the left big uh, picture that contain fragments of basalt, usually pillow lavas. Uh, mixed with other material uh, that can be already in the seafloor or can be the alteration of glass, which we call pelagonite. Um, so these are very typical as well because once the pillow lavas are erupted on the seafloor, the thermal shock is so high that lavas can fragment and generate these types of hyaloclastites. And the iron manganese nodules, they are very important because they can host a series of metal that are of interest for the industry, for like green technologies. Mm -hmm. So some people are very interested in mining the seafloor. Uh, we were not, so we, we were bringing these ones just like for fun. Uh, and sometimes some of the rocks that we want are inside these nodules. So we could extract them but so your your quest in doing the dredging was to try and find rocks that you could age date how do you age date i think the last slide shows us a little bit of, of what you do right uh, Is well this your research or actually i'm working with the isotopic analysis geochemistry analysis and uh -huh. our collaborators are gonna be age dating so my job is to use these short columns that are uh, in this picture to collect some uh, key elements that are going to give me some magmatic signature. Like I can figure out uh, what was the origin for the seamounts through this analysis. And to obtain the ages of the, these rocks, our collaborators are going to use plagioclase or which is a mineral phase um, that contains potassium and they can date these rocks through potassium argon or argon argon dating and or through the ground mass age dating so uh, now to, to my way of thinking there's a disconnect between the rocks that we saw in the previous slide they look pretty big how do you get a big rock into one of those glass tubes? Do you crush it or, or, or what, what, what's the process? Yes. So first of all, we use a rock saw and we cut them in several very, very tiny pieces, like small squares. Then we crush them in like sand size. Then they have to be 
uh, dissolved, leached, and finally they're gonna be in solution so that we can collect only the elements through these columns. Uh, there is a resin uh, and mm -hmm. once we insert the, the samples in this resin, the elements that we don't want or that we want, they're going to stick to the resin and all the rest is going to fall. So that's how we can end up with what interests us or um, not. I, I would think of it in terms of maybe you add an acid or something like that yeah. to remove yeah. material you weren't interested mm -hmm. in. And that's what you have in the bottom of the two. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so wh where do you see this kind of research going in your own career? Are you going to uh, forsake landlocked volcanic activity? Are you going to be an oceanographer or a <laughs> green geologist? I guess would be the the term. Uh, well, so I still I'm still not sure of what mm -hmm. I want to pursue for like after I finish, I'm pretty sure I'm going to take a postdoc. So okay. I'm just not sure if it's going to be like with subaerial volcanoes or with underwater volcanic chains. And uh, but I feel like this cruise has broadened up my possibilities a lot. And I have a lot of interest in um, marine geology. So this is for sure a possible choice for my for my career. And are you going to try and stay in Hawaii or go back yes. to Brazil? <laughs> I don't. I, yeah. Well, I would like to. to that one. <laughs> yeah, I would like to, uh, but I'm open to all the possibilities that yeah. might show up. Well, it's certainly important to understand the evolution of the volcanoes that Hawaii is built from, right? That, you know, there are many older ones, but I'm afraid, Natalia, we've, we've run out of time. So uh, let me just remind the viewers, you have been watching Science at Soast. I've been your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and my guest today has been Natalia Gar Pasqualon, who is a graduate student in the Earth Sciences Department at UH Manoa. So Natalia, thank you very much fascinating happy sailing i think would be a reasonable uh, way to end thank you again for being on the show and for the viewers please join us again next week when we'll have another graduate student talking about their research until then goodbye for now Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.